Good morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Savannah Sellers. Right now on Morning News Now, in the jury's hands, deliberations now underway in the Derek Chauvin murder trial after several hours of closing arguments. Highlights and analysis from Minneapolis as the city and the nation prepare for potential unrest. Frozen in time, tens of millions of unused coronavirus vaccines are sitting on freezer shelves. What the CDC is doing to get them out as soon as possible now that every U.S. adult is eligible for the shot. Farewell to Fritz. Well wishes and tributes are pouring in from around the world for former Vice President Walter Mondale, who passed away at age 93. How he transformed the West Wing into what it is today and the history he made when running for president. And the new radio, more people turning to TikTok for their tunes, more on the growing trend that's shaking up the music industry. Actually a pretty cool story. Lots of people getting these big record deals and all this kind of stuff after being on TikTok. I think it's funny, everything's like the new radio. The podcasts, they're <laughs> yeah. the new radio. Like <laughs> yearning yeah. to have radio again. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. We'll get to that a little bit later, but we begin once again in Minneapolis as the nation awaits a verdict in the murder trial of ex-officer Derek Chauvin following the death of George Floyd. The jury deliberated for four hours yesterday following several hours of closing arguments from both the prosecution and defense. The 12 jurors must now reach a unanimous verdict in each of the three charges against Chauvin, second degree unintentional murder, third degree murder, and second degree manslaughter. All this as protesters took to the streets for another night of demonstrations. Many of them cautiously optimistic the jury will find Chauvin guilty. I am hopeful. Um, it's scary that it only takes one jury. I don't have a ton of hope. I don't have much faith in this system. However, I am optimistic. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent Shaquille Brewster, who's been monitoring all the new developments there in Minneapolis for weeks now. Shaq, thank you for being with us. Good morning. Now, the fate of Derek Chauvin is now in the hands of a jury after several hours worth of closing arguments. What were the key takeaways from both sides in those arguments? Well, the prosecution began their closing arguments by saying his name was George Perry Floyd Jr. They talked about him as a person who was loved and a person who died under the knee of ex-officer Derek Chauvin. They accused Derek Chauvin of applying excessive force to George Floyd and leaving, leading to that uh, death by asphyxiation. And that is how they framed their entire arguments as they went through the key pieces of the testimony. For the defense, they said there's just simply too much doubt in this case. They used the phrase reasonable police officer more than 100 times, painting Derek Chauvin's actions as maybe not uh, or as unattractive, but very reasonable. I want you to listen to some of the highlights from the uh, closing arguments yesterday. This is not a prosecution of the police. It is a prosecution of the defendant. What the defendant did was not policing. What the defendant did was an assault. Use your common sense. Believe your eyes. What you saw, you saw. I submit to you that the state has failed to meet its burden of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. You have to be convinced that the defendant's actions caused the death of Mr. Floyd. Actions that happened before Mr. Floyd was arrested that had nothing to do with Officer Chauvin's activities are not the natural consequences of the defendant's actions. The drug ingestion, right? the bad heart, the diseased heart, the hypertension, all of these things existed before Mr. Chauvin arrived. You were told, um, for example, that Mr. Floyd died, that Mr. Floyd died because his heart was too big. You heard that testimony. And now having seen all the evidence, having heard all the evidence, you know the truth. And the truth of the matter is that the reason George Floyd is dead is because Mr. Chauvin's heart was too small. Now, also important yesterday, we saw the judge read those jury instructions before sending the jury on their way. He actually started the day with it and then gave them another reminder right before they left. Those are the specific instructions that tell the jury what the law is and how they should apply the law as they go ahead and start deliberating. We know they deliberated about four hours yesterday, and those deliberations will pick up later this morning.
Now, Shaq, we know the jury was not sequestered during the trial, but they will be sequestered throughout deliberations. That means no phone, no Internet, no TV or any other outside influences. Remind us who these jurors are and how this deliberation process works. That's right. They will be sequestered until they reach that unanimous verdict. And what we know about them, we know that seven of them are women. Uh, Two were dismissed yesterday. So it brought that total down to seven women five men in the total 12 jurors that are there. In terms of the racial breakdown, we know that six are white, four are black, two self-identify as mixed race. We know from their professions, it's a range of professions. We know that some are, uh, one was an auditor, another was a nurse, uh, someone someone was an accountant. Their ages range from uh, mid-20s to 60s. So uh, it's a pretty diverse group of people. It's uh, when you talk to uh, folks who are in the legal profession here in Hennepin County, they note that it's more diverse and it's a little younger than you normally see in a jury pool there. But, uh, you know, this is a group of people that now will determine the fate of ex-officer Derek Chauvin and will uh, be locked away doing that uh, until they reach that unanimous verdict. Hey, Shaq, you were in this city right after George Floyd's death. You were in this city as protests erupted there and around the world in reaction to George Floyd's death. And now you've been in Minneapolis covering this trial for several weeks. We know the city is preparing for possible unrest ahead of a verdict. I know it feels kind of like a collective holding of breath right now. Talk to us just about what it feels like to be there right now in the city and as somebody who has watched this unfold on the front lines now for a year. I'll say that sound that you played right before you introduced me of the people at the protest and that demonstration yesterday, that is what you hear as you go through Minneapolis. As you talk to people here, people, as I reconnect with people who I talked to right after George Floyd died, it's this idea that they know the trial is happening. It's very clear. Not only is there the barbed wire in the military vehicles that you see around me in the downtown area, but in the past week that has expanded to all across this city. There was a story in the Star Tribune yesterday talking about how on people's commute to work, they're passing military vehicles and it just makes them feel uneasy. They see boarded up windows uh, in buildings all across the city. So there is definitely that tension there. More than 3,000 National Guard members are fully activated. Yesterday, the governor asked for uh, help from the state of Ohio and Nebraska so more law enforcement officers can come down to this Twin City area. Uh, This is definitely something that is all consuming for people living here, and it's going to be that way until we get that verdict and probably a little bit after that. All right, Shaq, thank you so much. Controversy is growing over comments made by a congresswoman about the Chauvin murder trial. Now, Judge Cahill says it could be grounds for an appeal by the defense. I wish elected officials would stop talking about this case, especially in a manner that is disrespectful to the rule of law and to the judicial branch and our function. I want to bring in NBC News legal analyst and former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner. Glenn, good morning. Now, that was in reference to Congresswoman Maxine Waters comments that protesters need to get more confrontational if there's no guilty verdict in this trial. And what we just heard there from the judge was actually in response to Chauvin's lawyer even asking for a mistrial to be declared over water statements. Explain what's going on here and how this could affect the case. You know, uh, in the long run, I don't think it will affect the case. You could see Judge Cahill's frustration sort of boiling over a little bit, and I don't blame him um, because it's his job to give the defendant, Derek Chauvin, a fair trial without any outside influence from members of Congress or anybody. You know, it's also Judge Cahill's job to give the prosecutors a fair trial. I was a career prosecutor, and we don't technically represent anybody, but we do represent the interests of the people. And these prosecutors were representing the interests of the people of Minneapolis. So um, you could see that he has really worked mightily to try to make sure both parties got a fair trial. And I'm sure it was frustrating when you see a, a congresswoman say the kind of things Representative Waters said. It also is not unusual. Millions of people are talking about this case and the consequences of one verdict or another in this case. But here's what's most important to take away. If the judge believed Representative Waters' uh, comments had any impact on the trial, he would have taken that up. 
he would have he could have even held uh, an evidentiary hearing and he could have granted relief if he thought the trial was impacted. So I think it was nothing more than frustration when he said you may have an appellate issue mm. because if there was a legitimate legal issue, the judge would have wrestled with it right then and there. So I actually do not think there will be any appreciable appellate issue in the event of conviction. That is a great point. Great context there. Now, Glenn, a moment ago, we also heard some of the highlights from yesterday's closing arguments. Do you think each side was able to get their point across? How strong were they? Um, you know, I think given what we saw uh, out of the performances of the prosecutors and the defense attorney during the course of the trial, the, the closing arguments went pretty much as expected. Steve uh, Schleicher gave a professional, thorough closing argument. He had some really, I think, nice imagery and some nice rhetorical flourishes. You know, he, he hit all the nuts and bolts of the evidence. But when he said things like the pavement beneath George Floyd was as unyielding as were the men on top of George Floyd pushing him down. Those were important images, I think, for the jury to, to sort of um, to take back with them into the deliberation room. I do think the defense attorney lost a real opportunity because what Eric Nelson settled on was to call the testimony of five medical expert witnesses for the prosecution. And I'll use his word preposterous because they disagreed with his conclusion. The reason I say it was an opportunity lost is because what he had to work with was Dr. Baker's testimony. Dr. Baker was the only one who performed the autopsy, who had a firsthand impression of the injuries to George Floyd's body or the absence of injuries. So he should have argued, in my estimation, that Dr. Baker did not say he died of an asphyxial, he died an asphyxial death. He did not say he died of low oxygen. He could have made those findings, but he didn't. Now, let's talk about why that exonerates Derek Chauvin. He didn't have to insult all of the prosecution's medical experts, many of whom were very likable and compelling, like Dr. Tobin. And he didn't have to insult the common sense of the jurors. So I think for the defense, it was a bit of an opportunity lost. Now, Glenn, we know that we're awaiting this verdict on three charges here, second and third degree murder and second degree manslaughter. Two questions here for you. How do you think it's going to go for the jury? Is this difficult to come to a unanimous verdict on these charges? And then I'm also wondering, as a former prosecutor yourself, what this period's like in waiting for prosecution? Yeah. So, first of all, I had plenty of hung juries with 11 jurors voting to convict and one juror holding out for not guilty for acquittal. That's very frustrating. It's most frustrating for the family in, in a homicide case, but it's equally frustrating for prosecutors. I've always said it's hard to get 12 strangers to agree unanimously on anything, like where to have lunch, for example. But when you're asking them to make this most consequential decision regarding the life of a fellow human being, it's tough. But you know what? Juries reach unanimous verdicts every day. And I think given the strength of the evidence, if I had to predict, I would say they're they're going to convict him on all three counts, including the, the most serious count of second degree murder. Glenn, thank you so much. Very important context for us there. As the country braces for a verdict in the Chauvin trial, the White House has spent weeks weighing how it will respond. Administration officials have told NBC News that President Biden is preparing to deliver a statement once the verdict is in. NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli joins us now. Mike, good morning to you. So how has the White House been planning and do we know what the president's words to the nation will focus on? Well, Joe, President Biden has a full schedule this week. Just today, he's meeting with the Congressional uh, Hispanic Caucus. He's also virtually touring an electric uh, battery plant uh, in South Carolina. But make no mistake about it, this administration has been making plans for a week about how to deal with a verdict if and when it comes. Take a listen to White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki talking about this yesterday. We're in touch with local authorities. We're in touch with states, with governors, with mayors. Uh, and certainly, um, you know, we will continue to encourage peaceful protests, but we're not going to get ahead of uh, the verdict in the trial. And Joe, just in the last few moments, we learned a little bit more, which is George Floyd's brother saying to our colleagues on the Today Show that President Biden actually called the family yesterday. He said that President Biden knows what it's like to lose a, a member of the family. He said he's praying for the family and that he hope everything turns out OK. 
We remember he attended uh, George Floyd uh, visit with the family last year around the time of the funeral, too. Now, Mike, another thing I want to ask you about later this week, the president will be holding a big climate summit with world leaders virtually, of course. What will be his main goal for this? This summit was an idea that President Biden proposed in the campaign. He said he wanted to bring all the countries that were part of the Paris Climate Accord back to the table to talk about ways in which they would up the ante. Well, significantly, we know the big players here are going to be the United States and China. And leaders from those countries, including John Kerry, spoke over the weekend, pledged their commitment to increasing their goals for what they're doing to, to lower carbon emissions. Uh, Michael Regan, the EPA administrator, spoke with Al Roker yesterday. Wouldn't get ahead of the president's announcement about what the United States is willing to put on the table. He said he doesn't want to lose his new job just yet. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate it. Some sad news this morning. Former Vice President Walter Mondale has died at the age of 93. He represented Minnesota in the United States Senate before serving alongside President Jimmy Carter in the White House. Although he never fulfilled his dream of winning the presidency, he continued his lifelong devotion to public service. Former President Carter said in a statement Monday night, today I mourn the passing of my dear friend, Walter Mondale, who I consider the best vice president in our country's history. President Joe Biden worked with Mr. Mondale in a tribute with the First Lady. He said, when I arrived in the United States Senate in 1973, Walter Mondale was one of the first people to greet me. Through his work as a senator, he showed me what was possible. Before his death, Mr. Mondale wrote a letter thanking his team, saying he knew his time had come and that he was eager to join his late wife and daughter. NBC's Kevin Tibbles has a story. Walter Mondale changed the face of American politics, shattering the glass ceiling by picking Geraldine Ferraro as his running mate in 1984. I picked someone who I thought would make a superb vice president or, if necessary, a president. When Mondale, nicknamed Fritz, ran for president, he'd been in Democratic politics for nearly three decades, including 12 years in the Senate and four as Jimmy Carter's vice president. In the primaries, Mondale battled Colorado Senator Gary Hart, who ran on new ideas. In a debate, Mondale fought back with a fast food chain's ad slogan. When I hear your new ideas, I'm reminded of that ad. Where's the beef? Yeah. <laughs> The fall campaign against President Ronald Reagan was an uphill fight, challenging a popular incumbent at a time of peace and prosperity. Mr. Reagan will raise taxes, and so will I. He won't tell you. I just did. It was intended as candor, but was seen as a blunder. Mondale got a glimmer of hope when Reagan's age became an issue. In a debate, Reagan buried those doubts and Mondale's hopes. I am not going to exploit for political purposes my opponent's youth and inexperience. Mondale lost in a historic landslide. All of those states colored in blue are Ronald Reagan state. He won only his home state of Minnesota and the District of Columbia. Though only in his 50s, Mondale became a party elder, serving as U.S. ambassador to Japan. But in 2002, Mondale replaced Minnesota Democratic Senator Paul Wellstone on the ballot after Wellstone was killed in a plane crash just 11 days before Election Day. He narrowly lost his last hurrah. Mondale's wife of 59 years, Joan, died in 2014. They had two sons and a daughter who died of brain cancer in 2011. Walter Fritz Mondale once said he loved public life and always looked for ways to serve. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News. You know, speaking to friends and family back home in Minnesota, it's very emotional there mm. right now as everyone waits for the Derek Chauvin verdict. And now comes this. Exactly. And it, it's hard because no matter what your political views were, Walter Mondale, along with his mentor, Hubert Humphrey, really defined Minnesota politics. And so this is really emotional for a lot of people to see the end of this era. His wife, Joan, was also well known. She passed away a few years ago. And I actually knew his daughter, Eleanor. Oh. Uh, she was a TV radio host. She was well known in the area. You see her on the left there. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually went to her home in 2008 and interviewed her on the mm -hmm. day that she announced that her brain cancer oh, yeah. had returned. 
And sadly, she did pass away a few years later. So um, a family that was always in the public eye in Minnesota, very well known and with a wonderful legacy. Absolutely. It was something to see in that note that he wrote to his staff that he was eager to join both his wife and his daughter. Super emotional and just, I mean, what an incredible man, the way that he completely revamped the office of the vice presidency, bringing it to the West Wing, like you said, quite the legacy. Absolutely. Moving on now. The nation is jumping over an important hurdle this week in the race against the coronavirus. Now, everyone older than 16 is eligible for the vaccine. Right now, the CDC says nearly 53 million doses are sitting on freezer shelves ready to be used. NBC News Now correspondent Issa Gutierrez joins us now to walk through the biggest pandemic headlines. So, Issa, the nationwide vaccination effort has reached a new stage. No more confusing rules about who can get the shot and who can't. The challenge really now seems to be convincing people to get the shot. What is the CDC doing to try and get those tens of millions of unused doses into arms? Hey, Joe. So the CDC is really trying to get the message across to Americans right now that the infrastructure is there, the vaccine appointments are there, and the data is there for them to, as Dr. Fauci said at the White House yesterday, uh, to do their homework to decide whether or not, based on the data, they're ready to get vaccinated. Now, some of the biggest slowdowns um, that we're seeing as far as vaccination rates when we look across the country are in states with large rural populations, places like Wyoming, Montana, Mississippi, West Virginia. Uh, and as we look at vaccine hesitancy across the country, we do know that that is declining. However, still about 17 percent of Americans say that they want to wait and see whether or not they're comfortable getting the vaccine. That percentage rises when we look among black Americans to about 24 percent. And it goes even higher, according to recent polls, when we look at um, men, GOP men. So some polls show that over 40 percent of Republican men are hesitant to get the vaccine. And just as uh, recently as earlier this month, that included a few GOP senators as well. Joe. Now, Issa, the State Department plans to expand its travel advisories, which means a big hike in the number of countries labeled do not travel. What more can you tell us about those changes? Joe, the State Department is saying that it plans on boosting uh, that list of do not travel uh, countries to 80 percent of countries worldwide. So right now they have 34 countries on that list. That includes countries like Chad, Haiti, Brazil, Argentina and others. In order to get to that 80 percent, they're expected to add uh, about 130 countries to that list. And they're citing unprecedented risk to travelers due to the pandemic due to COVID-19. Now, at this point, the White House um, has not given a timeline uh, on when those restrictions are expected to be lifted. Joe. Issa, thank you so much. And while we're talking about international travel, let's take a look at what's making mm -hmm. news around the world this morning. NBC News correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome. Hi, Claudio. Good morning. Good morning, Savannah. Well, with 273,000 new cases reported on Monday, India is confirmed to be the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic right now in the world. Now, a week-long lockdown has been imposed in the capital, New Delhi, where one out of three people now are testing positive. And with 15 million overall infections since the start of the pandemic, well, India is now confirmed to be the second worst affected country in the world after the U.S. Now, Savannah, this one is for you. I know you're a big fan of Arsenal. Arsenal is one of the teams that have joined other big soccer teams in Europe to uh, start this what they call a super league. I don't know what you think about that, but I'll tell you what politicians think about that here in Italy, uh, here in Europe. In Italy, the prime minister Mario Draghi said that he opposes the idea of a super league because it goes against meritocracy and against the spirit of the sport. And in the UK, prime minister Boris Johnson said that his government will do everything it can to make sure that that plan does not go ahead. But it's not, not only soccer as we know it that is under threat. Coffee also apparently is under threat from climate change because there is a study that suggests that by 2050 a lot of the land, about half of the land that is being used to grow high quality Arabica coffee may become unproductive because of rising temperatures. But no need to worry there as well because scientists appear to have the solution. They said that they rediscovered a plant, a coffee plant in West Africa that uh, resists higher temperatures and it is as good as high quality Arabica coffee, guys.
Phew, that would have been here. bad news for it, two morning drinkers. It is a big concern, though. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've done stories yeah, out of places. Me too. Yeah. I'll leave on coffee. <laughs> <laughs> it is a concern. And to be fair, I'm not the huge soccer fan. I don't know that much. It's my boyfriend, but he is a huge Arsenal fan, so I, I've read in a little. <laughs> well, ask him. <laughs> yeah. Claudio, thanks All so right. much. Time to check on your morning news now weather. Hopefully it's a little less angry. Yeah, yeah. Bill Karens is back. Hopefully in a better mood. (laughs) I have a great attitude today. I've I've turned the corner. Uh, Life is good. Uh, So let's talk about all the great things going on right now. The kids are so excited in Denver. Five inches of snow on the ground, running around, rolling in it, sledding. Boulder's got eight inches of snow. It's snowing this morning in Kansas City. I heard reports people running around catching snowflakes in their mouth. What a great time in the middle of April in Missouri right now with the snow falling. So that's the, you know, uh, so additional snow. I mean, we may even give you a little more in Colorado on just to add to your glory. And then as we go throughout the rest of the day, the snow will move into areas like Indiana, northern Ohio, Detroit, Cleveland, Erie, and Buffalo. Make your plan to get out there and play in that wonderful white stuff here on this third week of April and even portions of northern New England. So the forecast today, let's forget about the 75 and sunny in D.C. and New York. I mean, that's the simple stuff to end beautiful weather on the East Coast today. Let's get into that gorgeous weather in the middle of the country with the falling temperatures. Grab your jacket, your gloves, and your hats because winter has returned. How fantastic of a forecast is that? Wow. That is... Downright perky, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for turning it around for us. We'll see you in a little bit. Coming up, the factory that botched millions of COVID vaccine doses is now being asked to pause production. The reason behind the FDA's decision and what this means for Johnson & Johnson next. The Food and Drug Administration has asked Emergent Biosolutions to pause its manufacturing of COVID vaccines. This is while the agency investigates its plant in Baltimore responsible for ruining millions of Johnson & Johnson shots late last month. That shot, of course, now on a pause across the country after six cases of rare blood clots potentially linked to the vaccine. We're still waiting on the FDA's decision on future redistribution of the shot. NBC News correspondent Ali Vitale joins us now. Ali, good morning. Now walk us through the FDA's decision to ask Emergent to stop producing vaccines altogether. Yeah, Savannah, I think it's really important, too, that we focus on the two issues that are happening here that are pretty separate. There's the larger question of use and dissemination of this J&J vaccine. You touched on why there's a pause on that right now nationwide, and that's because of that issue with rare blood clots. And then here specifically, we're focusing on the manufacturing at this plant, a subcontractor for Johnson & Johnson. And I think it's really helpful to just walk through the timeline here. You start at the end of March when we first find out from a report in the New York Times that millions of doses of the vaccine were botched here at this plant behind me because of a mix up in ingredients. At this point, this plant was manufacturing both the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Then you fast forward to April uh, 3rd, where the Biden administration frustrated. They put J&J in charge of this plant. This plant then stops manufacturing the AstraZeneca vaccine. They just start focusing on the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And then last week, April 12th, we find out the FDA inspected this plant. And then a few days later, we're talking Friday, April 16th, we find out that this plant has been asked to pause production of the J&J vaccine and to quarantine anything that they may have made in the meantime. So this is coming against the backdrop of the larger issue of use of the J&J vaccine nationwide. But this specifically here, we're talking about manufacturing at this one plant. So, Ali, thank you. That's an important distinction there. Let's talk a little bit more about the broader impact here, J&J in general being on pause. The CFO of Johnson & Johnson was on CNBC this this morning. What do you say about the company's outlook right now? There's a really important thing that's happening here because there are contracts to make 100 million doses of the J&J single dose vaccine 
by the end of May. I was struck because in a statement that the company put out last night after this FDA pause of this plant that we're at today, I want to show you a little bit of that statement because Johnson & Johnson says at this time, it's premature to speculate on any potential impacts this plant's closure could have on the timing of our vaccine deliveries. They go on to say that they remain committed to delivering 100 million doses of the COVID-9 vaccine to the government and helping bring an end to this global pandemic. But not in that statement was that end of May deadline. They had reiterated it in previous moments. They did not reiterate it here. But listen to what their CFO said when he was pressed on this just a few minutes ago on CNBC. In that interview, he says that he's confident that they'll be able to get these 100 million doses. I didn't hear the word may in that interview. At the same time, though, these are contracts. And so this does present a roadblock. But they do need to get as many millions of these doses as they can on the timeline that they laid out with the U.S. government. I would also say on this other larger issue of whether use of this vaccine can come into play nationwide, Dr. Anthony Fauci has said that we're going to likely hear a decision on that as early as Friday from the FDA and the CDC. The CFO of J&J was also asked about that, and he said that he hopes that by the end of this process, Americans can feel confident about the vaccine because it has gone through all of the steps of the process that's laid out for if there is a problem, then it's mitigated. We could see potentially restrictions put on this vaccine if it's put back into use or just disclaimers put on the label about potential side effects. Allie, thank you for rolling with that. He also said we are certainly going to do our part to make sure we have a favorable outcome there, deliver in the U.S. and around the globe. Allie, thank you so much. We missed you while you've been working on your book, and I am loving the blonde girl. Good to see you. So glad to be back. <laughs> thank you. Let's bring in Dr. Ali Raja. He's the executive vice chair of emergency medicine at Massachusetts General and an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. So, doctor, let's talk about what's happening at the emergent plant there. Even if the J&J vaccine gets the OK to resume, are you worried at all that pausing production at the emergent plant could have an impact? Joe, I really am. Uh, even if they get the go ahead to resume uh, giving the J&J &J vaccine, which I'm really hopeful that they do, shutting down this plant, which was producing a lot of vaccine, is definitely going to have an impact. But here's the thing. I agree with the reason for shutting it down. We need people to trust in these vaccines. As, an Ali, as Ali just said, we need Americans to feel confident. So if pausing inspires confidence that we're doing the right thing, then it's the right way for us to go. Now, the CDC director said yesterday that they're looking at a handful of cases of possible severe side effects from the J&J &J vaccine, in addition to those six blood clot, blood clot cases previously reported. What's your reaction to that news? Joe, I'm not surprised. We all knew that there would be some more cases like this coming to light. That's why the CDC panel is taking an extra week. There have been millions and millions and millions of doses of the J&J &J vaccine. We're going to see some new cases of the blood clots coming. But I still hope that we're going to be able to get the J&J &J vaccine out to most people again, hopefully within the next week or so. Dr. Raja, thank you so much. Appreciate it. New details are being revealed about the 19-year-old alleged gunman who shot and killed eight people at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis last week. His past mental state is spurring calls to strengthen the state's red flag law, a process aimed at preventing such attacks. Here's NBC News correspondent Katie Beck with more. Well, Savannah and Joe, investigators are still facing many unanswered questions in this case and now facing new questions about the gunman's past and how he was able to legally obtain two assault rifles. The shock of mass violence in Indianapolis absorbed by those left behind. Now gatherings to grieve. It's very healing for me to be here. Support and solidarity mourning the five women and three men who showed up to work at the FedEx facility Thursday and never returned home. Two questions after investigators confirmed the gunman legally purchased the two assault rifles used in the shooting. The system failed our state. We have a red flag law, but it's very weak. It could be much stronger. 
Prosecutors say the gunman was given a mental health evaluation in March of 2020 after police detained him based on suicide threats and a shotgun was confiscated from his home. We did not file a follow-up petition uh, because we had always already achieved our objective, which was to prevent that firearm from going back to this particular individual. Investigators say there wasn't significant evidence to red flag the suspect through a court process. Still, prosecutors say the Indiana law should be stronger, allowing more time to investigate and fast access to a suspect's mental health file. I think people hear red flag and they think it's the panacea to all these issues. It's not. What it is is a good start where there's a number of loopholes. Healing from tragedy, calling for change to prevent another. And now many in the community are calling for the closure of the loopholes in the red flag laws, especially those in the sick community, from where half of the victims were members. Savannah and Joe. Coming up, an exclusive look inside an electric car battery mega factory. That's part of our week long series focused on the climate challenge up next. On a busy news morning, here is one story that might catch your eye. It's hard to believe that over a year ago, the world was introduced to the likes of Joe Exotic, Carol Baskin, and all of their big cats on the Netflix series Tiger King, Murder, Mayhem, and Madness. Well, now a limited series will tell the story of the relationship between Exotic and his arch enemy Baskin. We now know that John Cameron Mitchell will star as the show's title character, Joe Exotic, opposite Kate McKinnon. Now, in a statement, Mitchell said, I'm thrilled to take on the role of this modern folk anti-hero. Limited series is set to air across our parent company, NBC Universal's television and streaming platforms. This is very cool. I, I've known Mitchell since his uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch days, a character he created that's become rather iconic. So it'll be interesting to see what he does with uh, Joe Exotic. And I'm very excited about Kate McKinnon. She is talented, so I can't wait to see that. It'll be good. It well, thanks, Joe. Now, from Hurricane Harvey to the winter freeze that brought down its power grid, Houston's critical infrastructure has been pushed to the brink by extreme weather events in recent years. It's a warning for the rest of the nation to be on the lookout as the climate continues to evolve. NBC's Lester Holt reports from Houston. Savannah and Joe, we're here in Houston to begin NBC News cross-platform coverage of the climate challenges we face. And while it was warm and pleasant here, a series of extreme weather events in the region in recent years have left a lingering chill about its future. It broke virtually every rainfall record in U.S. history. Four years ago, Hurricane Harvey washing away nearly everything in the Beale family's home. Water was everywhere. In the house, in the house, coming from up under the house, coming from my roof. The family of six was still rebuilding from that catastrophic storm. Then came February's crippling freeze. Their pipes burst. For days, they had no power, no water. They had to move out again. What was that storm like? Oh, it was terrible. It was painful. How cold did it get? <sighs> so about cold. five degrees in there. Extreme weather from those hurricanes and winter storms in Texas to California's heat wave last summer that led to rolling blackouts, growing more frequent and severe. And that has revealed vulnerabilities in our critical infrastructure. Here in Texas, the power grid failed during the deadly cold snap in February. People were trying to heat their homes. Plants couldn't keep up. And that, say experts, should be a warning to the rest of the country. If we do nothing, then it looks like climate change is going to get inexorably worse. Cheryl LaFleur is the former chair of the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. She says we must put the work in to build more reliable and resilient power grids. This is really a double strategy. We need to fight climate change. At the same time, we need to be ready for storms because we can't make everything perfect tomorrow. She points to possible solutions, like building better connections between power grids so energy can be diverted when an area sees a spike in demand. And she says power plants need to be modified so they're better prepared to withstand all kinds of weather. After more than 100 people died in the February storm, some officials here in Texas are pushing to winterize the system so natural gas, coal, and nuclear plants stay online. And renewable energy sources like wind turbines don't freeze again. 
what happened in 2021, quite frankly, in large part was foreseeable and preventable. Sylvester Turner is Houston's mayor. So if we do nothing, what happens to a city like Houston? If you don't do anything, then you're going to repeat this movie over and over again. Uh, and it's going to cost uh, in terms of people losing their lives, people losing their property, and it's going to affect the overall economy. Meanwhile, Craig and Angela Beal are still rebuilding and bracing for Houston's scorching summer when the grid could be tested again. Do you think this is going to happen again? Yes. I know it's going to happen again. I believe it's going to get worse. As the years go by, it gets worse. Extreme weather is just one of many climate challenges we face as part of our cross-platform series on the climate challenge. This morning, we're also taking a look at the global race toward electric vehicles. NBC News has an exclusive look inside what is expected to be one of the largest electric vehicle battery factories in the country. NBC News correspondent Josh Letterman joins us now from Lordstown, Ohio, outside that sprawling mega factory, which is now under construction and set to open next year. Josh, good morning. So this plant will build nothing but batteries for electric cars and trucks. Tell us, why is that so important and how will this plant help the U.S. land on the global map when it comes to electric vehicles? Right now, Joe, we don't really make a whole lot of electric vehicle batteries here in the United States. They're mostly made overseas and imported, uh, even for cars that are sold here in the U.S. And so this is really an effort to change that. And you see GM uh, and LG building not only this plant, uh, but another one in Tennessee. Inside, we got a chance to look at it yesterday. Uh, it's going to be a little bit more like the kind of factory that would build computer parts than an actual auto plant. Take a listen to the way Tom Gallagher, the chief operating officer for the plant, described it while we were inside. How different does this look than a traditional auto factory? Oh, quite different. Um, it's all high-tech equipment, computer-driven. There's no material movement or lifting by people. It's all by automation and handling. So as an operator, quite different task. GM says that the batteries that are going to be built in this factory behind me uh, will have a range of up to 400 miles. They'll also be able to go from zero to 60 in three seconds, Joe. Now, Josh, President Biden's massive infrastructure plan does include $174 billion to promote electric vehicles, but Americans haven't exactly embraced them. So what are the challenges here when trying to convince Americans? Well, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing because we haven't had a lot of electric vehicles in the U.S., so we haven't built out charging stations across the country like automakers say that we need to. We haven't built the supply chains up here in the U.S. to actually make them uh, domestically. And consumers are concerned about a, a lack of cheap options for affordable uh, electric vehicles, as well as sometimes a, a lack of uh, diversity of types of vehicles. Take a listen to what ki uh, the president of Ultium Cell, building this factory told me about those concerns. There isn't any concern about the, the performance and then price. I think uh, we are entering into the generation where this huge transformation is happening. So we have no concern about demand in the market at all. And in fact, automakers are working to diversify the range of offers that will be available to consumers. In fact, the batteries that are going to be made here will be going into, among other things, Cadillacs and electric Hummers. And quickly, Josh, President Biden is planning to virtually tour another electric battery facility this afternoon in South Carolina. What's his message expected to be there? I think you'll expect to see President Biden talking about the critical role in reducing tailpipe emissions from cars and vehicles. Transportation makes up about 29 percent of U.S. greenhouse gas emissions. The Biden administration working to bring that down, Joe. All right. Josh Letterman, thank you so much. Coming up, it's not just a video app. TikTok is influencing our airwaves. How Gen Z's favorite social media website is becoming one of the top ways to find new music. Next. Parler, the alternative social media platform that's drawn conservatives but also far-right extremists, is available again in the Apple App Store after it was banned in the days following the January 6th Capitol Hill riot. Insurrectionists used the application to communicate before and during the siege. NBC News technology reporter Ben Collins joins us now. Ben, good morning. Now, Apple CEO Tim Cook had said it was, quote, straightforward decision to ban Parler because they weren't a 
adhering to the guidelines of the App Store. So what's changed? Are they back because now they are, in fact, following those rules? You know, they had a huge change of heart after they lost uh, a large portion of their business over the last few months. They weren't available on the Apple App Store for the last few months, and their user base completely plummeted. There was there was not much left there unless you had downloaded the app for the 8th of January. You weren't really allowed to be on that website from an Apple device. So, you know, they had to they had to play by the rules. They had to get rid of all the Nazi glorification. They had to get rid of all the death threats. And that's what they decided to do. They are playing uh, they're playing ball with Apple now, basically. And Ben, they also had lost their web host. So what's the status of that? Are they going to be back in the mainstream? And regardless of where it is, whether it's via the App Store or on the Internet, are the old users going to return and trust it like they did? Are they going to want to be using this version? It's hard to know. You know, a lot of these extremists that went into the Capitol on January 6th, they got caught because they were on Parler. They're uh, mm-hmm. they're GPS data was exposed because of Parler. You know, but they will they will find their way back. They found hosting over the last couple of months on a much smaller host. It's not the same thing. It's not as easy to use. It's not as fast. But they will be allowed back on the Internet, and they're going to try again. All right, Ben Collins, thank you so much. The popular app TikTok is changing the way people consume new music. Songs that originate as trends are now being played on the radio and are even getting nominated for music awards. Stay tuned. Digital reporter Maya Eaglin took a closer look at how TikTok is impacting the music business. I was freaking out when Doja Cat was doing her performance and she did the dance. Like, when in history has a Grammy's performance included a TikTok dance that, like, helped make a song viral? I never thought for one minute that we would be glued to one platform to discover new talent. At this year's Grammys, half of the songs up for Record of the Year were major trends on TikTok. And the top two most viewed artists on the app, Megan Thee Stallion and Doja Cat, were up for Best New Artists, with Meg taking it home. It absolutely is um, um, changing what the industry thinks will be hot next. I think overall, it, it, TikTok has kind of been an equalizer in letting the audience determine like what songs are, are hits and what artists become signed. My style. I'll see you, Nick. Yeah, I'll see you, Nick. Um, it's kind of got like a Latin um, uh, rhythm, similar drums and all that. And then you got tropical vibes in it, so. Josh685 is just one example of what happens when your song blows up. We heard that labels were actually tracking you down. It was like a hectic, hectic. Some of them I uh, got to my mom as well, because um, I didn't know what was going on. For me, what was like shocking the most was just the whole numbers, the thing just going up in millions, just watching everyone dance. So it's just, for me being like, uh, at the time, not, not known, just just a guy that just made beats in his bedroom. You know, that was really my goal, but it, like it happened and I'm blessed and I'm happy that it did. Eventually, that beat made it to the top of the charts after a collaboration with Jason Derulo. So I know you don't know who put your beat on TikTok originally, but what would you say to them now? I'd say a massive thank you, like, I can't, like, thank them enough. It's given people the ability to choose what music, or at least some of what music becomes popular because it's the people who are picking what they love. It's the actual audience versus, like, the industry who's choosing what songs rise at the top. Avenue Beats signed with Big Machine Label Group in 2019 and were trying to make it in country before their song F2020 broke out on TikTok. Once we kind of decided to stop trying to fit into the space we were, you know, given, it kind of just worked after that. And I put out some music that nobody liked, and that's why I'm like, low-key. Yeah, like once we posted F2020, it wasn't even a conversation. They were like, okay, cool. This is what you're doing now. Like, great. And we were like, it was that easy. I'm not going to write a viral song. Yeah, that's all. Five or ten years ago, five years ago, three years ago, you know, it's like choosing the song to go to radio. And then from there, you're kind of signaling to the audience that this is the hit, even though, you know, they might disagree. I miss the days of of A where you could develop something and you you could go top down and, and we had that kind of power. We just don't have that anymore. We, we're still very valuable in the space. 
but you're foolish as a record company if you see something blowing up and you don't go after it. So how has TikTok as a platform changed your art and music? I, I think it honestly has just given us the freedom to make the music that we've always wanted to make the exact way that we've always wanted to make it with like no boxes. And then also it's given us the opportunity to like fast track us to like our audience and like our people who are going to love what we do. It's kind of taking away the middleman in a, in a really important way. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.